So um, again, if you have, um, if you wouldn't mind turning off your uh, video, if you're uh, if you're an attendee, um, we've got quite a lot of uh, visuals to share with you today, and um, we're going to kick off actually um, with um, somebody who I've worked with uh, a number of times quite uh, over the last few years, and that's Liz Ellis from National Heritage Lottery Fund. So Liz, um, as I said, is a long time collaborator and she's policy project manager, the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And we've been talking um, recently about the importance of wellbeing in the place agenda. And I thought it would be a really uh, interesting and valuable um, contribution to have Liz here today. Um, not not least because National Heritage Lottery Fund is one of the major funders along with Arts Council of great, the Great Place programme of which there were 16 in total. So um, I'm going to move over now to um, to Liz. Um, thank, and after Liz has spoken, there will be some time for questions. Uh, we've got three about three spots for questions over the over the session today. If you have questions, if you want to pop them in the chat, um, that would be great. But you, um, I'll try and give you an opportunity to actually ask your question sort of verbally as well. But if you've got questions, if you put them in the chat, then we, we kind of know the kind of things that people want to talk about. That would be um, re really useful. So um, I'll just pass over to, um, to Liz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And first of all, I just want to say a really big thank you and congratulations to all of you on this call who've been involved in so much really impressive strategic practice, um, wonderful innovation, everything you've been doing across Great Manchester, great place over these years. As Julie says, I've kept in touch both with her and other colleagues involved. And none of us could possibly have predicted the kind of landscape that you've all been having to work in with COVID. So I just want to really extend my congratulations to you all on what you've achieved. I thought before I go into the context of um, the theme of today, our place, and how that fits with National Lottery Heritage Fund, I'll just give you kind of a little bit of context. So as Julie says, I'm Liz Ellis. I'm policy project manager at National Lottery Heritage Fund. I lead policies on inclusion and well-being. Um, but I just wanted to share a very brief story as an example of some of the distance we've travelled over these few decades in UK cultural policy and some of the opportunities for us ahead. So in the early 1980s, I was a staff nurse in an acute mental health hospital in South London, and I was getting involved in organising creative activities on the wards and in the local park, together with adults and young people who were inpatients in the mental health hospital. Then as now, there were all sorts of intersections between social inequalities, racial inequalities, gender inequalities, and these were really evident in the patient demographics. And I decided to apply for a small arts grant to a London funder to think how we could extend some of this work that was happening in the hospital. And when I explained the inpatient mental health context to the funder, he very kindly but quite firmly explained to me that the patients were not part of the community. They were in hospital and they therefore they did not belong to the community. And I was really taken aback and hopefully politely, but I pointed out that these people had been living in the community, were part of the community still and would return to the community. And as such, their cultural opportunities, their cultural rights were being denied just at the point of the greatest need. So that really made me think a lot at the time about how funders, health staff, the cultural sector, how we all work together. I never did get that funding, but it gave me a lot of stamina for cross-sector ambition and the kind of conversations that so many of you on this call today, I know have been having over a long time, many years, I think it also demonstrates that experience, demonstrates the kind of silos that do exist, in some areas still exist, in how we think about each other and how we think about our shared and our differing vulnerabilities. 
So I'm very interested in thinking about the role of cultural rights and how these are indivisible from all the other human rights to housing, to health, to education, and how we can all work better, better together to challenge these kind of inequalities. So since then, moving on from that time, there's been so much growth across intersectional ways of working. So place-based alliances, culture and health alliances have been growing across the UK. Embedding well-being is core within Scottish government policy. Uh, we see it in well-being for future generations in Welsh government policy. And of course, the all-party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being a few years ago produced a brilliant report, Creative Health, with so many recommendations that many of you are actively involved in delivering now. And of course, in Greater Manchester, the work of Clive Parkinson and many of you again on this call in producing Social Glue is really important too, in how we have these kinds of alliances across sectors. Placing people with lived experience at the centre is so much part of Culture Health Wellbeing Alliance that many of us are on this call are involved in too. So, as I say, I recognise the amount of work that you've all been delivering in your strategic planning, in the cultural practice, and I'll move on to the role we have as a funder, National Lottery Heritage Fund. So, we're the major UK funder sustaining and transforming UK heritage. And for anyone new to our funding, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat uh, later. But I just wanted to talk about that people centred approach to our funding. Our mandatory outcome is to involve a wider range of people and heritage. And that's based on all the evidence that exists of the barriers and inequalities that prevent people having access, whether it's landscape and nature, museums, intangible heritage, so many other forms. So our scale of funding runs from £3,000 to several million, but that mandatory inclusion outcome informs it all. So in terms of the work that we're discussing across Great Place, but in particular our focus today on our, our place, I thought I'd touch briefly on the role that wellbeing has as an outcome in our work too. So clearly in the context of COVID-19, how our relationship to our local communities plays out is crucial, not only in terms of a local economy, um, the rebuilding of perhaps local tourism, but in personal and community well-being too. And the role of place is crucial in our funding. During November, we'll be sharing some case studies of strong place-based practice across the UK. And I've been looking at some of the evaluations that have been coming through, as Julie says, from the 16 projects involved in Great Place. I was really struck in London, the artist Faisal Abdullala referring to the slow pace that's needed to build trusted relationships. And that approach to place very much informs us at the National Lottery Heritage Fund. We recognise that working in collaboration takes time. Building relationships across sectors is really time consuming. And I think it's a tribute to the work that you've all been achieving, those really strong cross-sector links you've been developing. We're a project funder, so we have a greater impact by working together, by working together with all of you on this call and the kind of collaborations that exist, whether it's with local authorities, whether it's with grassroots communities. I think that role, as I mentioned, of linking up the, the role of heritage in relation to regeneration, local economy, tourism. There's aspects that are so full of opportunity ahead, and that's something that the place-based strategy for the fund is looking to develop even further. So just before I wrap up and um, go back to Julie, just to um, add in that as a funder, we contribute to uh, Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. 
tackling loneliness network, um, the social connections funders network. We, we absolutely recognize how heritage has the capacity to connect us with each other in really new and unexpected and wonderful ways. Uh, last week, I was able to join Julie's previous webinar where the kind of brilliant creative practice that was being shared is absolutely about those new creative connections, whether it's providing opportunities for young neurodivergent people or to hear unheard LGBTQ stories. So I'll put a couple of links in the chat in relation to our funding and the kind of outcomes we look for. But as I say, I'll just finish with uh, a congratulations to everything that's been achieved and how much that connects through us with that person centred approach to our work together. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. Um, it, some, one of the things that you talked about, the, the idea of time is um, it really resonated with me. Um, I'm just finalizing an article for arts professional and that's one of the major points of learning i think that i've, I've highlighted as um, coming out of great place that we do need that funding cycle should be a framework not a straitjacket and that proper like long-term relationships take a long time to develop and it's very easy to reject opportunities because there is no time to do them so i'll give an example of um social prescribing pilot that we're doing that actually began really near the end of the program and we just articulated as our program outcome the relationship not necessarily the the um the contact with participants that's something that we're just letting go as an outcome it's it, it's there it will happen but it's the relationships that the, the are the major outcome so thank you and paul in the um in the chat, you talk, you've made a point here that sustainability of funding is key, especially in building and maintaining trust among more marginalised groups who may be more reluctant to come forward initially. So relationships only develop over medium to long term. Yeah, I think that's 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 really true. Do you want to say any more about that, Paul? Just to say thank you, Liz, for that it was a very informative uh, piece. Uh, very interesting. And just to say that, you know, if I look at things like the Ambition for Aging micro grants, again, you know, there's been a second round of those available. And that's great because it can build and sustain on the successes in round one. But I think if you are building up those relationships, I think unless you have a longer term framework for funding, then it, it, it may take a lot longer because building up that trust initially may take time. And then to suddenly be faced with the loss of the project, suddenly those people feel then, oh, I've been let down because I thought it was here for the long term. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's the same old usual. I won't come forward again. And that's the risk, I think. That's the potential damage that we need to recognise in some of these funding landscapes. But I think it's great that funding is being made available because culture is so integral to all our lives, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I think you make such an important point there. And I know there's a couple of National Lottery Heritage Fund colleagues on the call. So in the different roles we um, have, so Nathan obviously leading engagement across the North team, Amanda who heads up place policy for the fund. I think we all absolutely agree with you that I think in terms of that sustainability, and I think sometimes I think as well as funding, it's also about convening. So when Julie um, shared with me her plans for these, this series, I thought, what a brilliant opportunity, what a way for us to be able to get together, you know, in ways that might have been difficult actually at a face-to-face -face conference to share what good practice looks like, to be honest about the kinds of challenges of sustaining partnerships. Um, but yes, absolutely. I, I agree with you and I know my colleagues um, at the Heritage Fund agree to that kind of long term building of relationships. And I think for us across the scale of funding, that's one of the things that whether it's a small volunteer led group who are just getting started or how the progression can continue to have um, a much more strategic impact ahead, you know, all that is really time consuming. And I suppose for me that that kind of reference to whether it's the slow food movement or the slow cultural movement in um, Faisal Abdullah's uh, part of his evaluation in Great Place really, really struck me because I think that that very much resonates with some of the learning across COVID as well. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much.
Yeah, and Nathan makes uh, an important point in the chat as well about um, learning around long-standing relationships in Pennine, Lancashire over many years. Um, and that Claire, who's on this call, who I've been working with, has some knowledge of this, <laughs> and uh, as many others do on the seminar. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Um, one of the legacies from Great Place, actually, just before we move on, um, but one of the, one of the things that I'm moving on uh, to do. So I'm now seconded to Health and Social Care Partnership, but then also back into the Combined Authority. Uh, Kind of going round in an endless circle, um, working on a, an initiative called Live Well. So this is something which is very early days. It's a, a mayoral commitment, so it's a manifesto commitment from the election. So um, Andy Birmingham is very, very committed to seeing a, a basic level of service in each of the ten districts, uh, and that's around community well-being. So it's an infrastructure. So it's it's a kind of a beyond social prescribing program which looks at community investment as key so that's something that we will be taking what well, we're taking forward at the moment so we're just writing getting a paper together on it and we're starting a working group with the voluntary sector to look at how we can really create a sustainable offer in and with communities and arts and culture is one of six key pillars um, alongside access to green spaces um, physical activity, um, help with work and skills. It's um, keep an eye out for, for Live Well. Uh, I know it's a confusing name because quite a few things are called that, but um, it's, it's what it's called. So um, yeah, we'll be developing the thinking around that and hopefully talking to um, to Heritage Lottery Fund about National Heritage Lottery Fund about that and uh, and others as well. So um, we're going to move on now, actually. Um, to uh, talk to um, hear from Karen Shannon. So um, Karen is the director of Manchester Histories um, and we worked with Karen on uh, a, a programme called Artivist and this the idea of this pro of this project was to uh, animate local archives by creating a collaboration between artists and local um, local art um, archivists. So, Karen, you're going to tell us um, some, about some of the learning from that. And I think the reason why we're talking about this project here is because we're thinking we're looking at identity and people and and work that's really rooted in place and in neighbourhoods and in local areas. Um, so, over to you, Karen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Julie. Um, I wonder, um, yeah, if we can um, just um, show some of the slides. I think that's, um, if we go back a few slides, I think um, I just wanted to put Manchester histories as well into some context as well. So um, to sort of sh uh, tell you where we're coming from. So Manchester histories is a, a small charity. We're based in the University of Manchester, but it's our role um, across GM to explore the past and shape the, and shape the future, working and connecting people to histories and heritage. Next slide, please. So um, we're um, a values led um, organization and it's quite interesting that Liz was saying around looking at kind of human values and what that means. And we've done a lot of work around values and how that fits into our work, but also connecting with communities. And we've worked with um, the Common Cause Foundation and you'll hear a bit later from um, Tom and Gabby about that and, and how how we have um, used um, some of the kind of knowledge and intelligence around what the people of Greater Manchester think is important to them and how it's helped to influence our own work. So our values are compassion, curiosity and justice. And I guess around our aims, this particular aim that we're looking at is how um, we can bring sort of creative innovation and how we tell stories and using things like archives and collections and that history is for everyone and it's part of our role um, to ensure that it's relevant to people and Artifice was a, was a part of this kind of um, a, a exploration of how we look at identity and place. Can I have the next slide, slide please? Thank you. So um, we run a programme of, um, you know, engagement over the year, but we also run a Manchester Histories Festival that takes place every couple of years. And the next festival is going to be based on the history of climate change, past, present and future. So quite timely. 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Artifice project and what, what happened on that project. Could I have the next slide, please? So really, the project was about bringing archives and collections to life using sort of co-creation practice with artists and also creativity. Can I have the next slide, please? So the project at that time, a couple of years ago, we were, we were leading on the Peterloo massacre. So this project also connected to that um, with the themes of protest, democracy and freedom of speech. I'm not going to talk about Peterloo Massacre today. If I'll, set, I'll share with you a, a, um, web, a web link at the end where you can find out more about that if you don't know about the story. Can I have the next slide, slide please? So for those that don't sort of work in sort of collections or archives um, here today, um, I, I think it's important just to say that they are important, they're a witness to the past really. And they do provide evidence and explanation and a justification for past actions and current decisions. So they are stories, they tell stories about people and place and places. Um, sometimes the stories might not be true, sometimes they're contested, but they are stories that, <clears throat> that do tell, that do tell um, uh, stories of, of what happened in the past, but also how that influences the future as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, as Julie was saying, the project, um, the Artifice project was a collaboration between ourselves and Great Place and also Greater Manchester Libraries and Archives Group. And what the project set out to do, we worked across the 10 boroughs um, of, Greater Man of Greater Manchester but it was looking at this kind of relationship between artists and archivists to look at and explore the importance of like a creative process and really to look at how we might develop a deeper understanding of how archives can tell stories about place, but also how they can be opened up more um, and engage with people in new and creative ways. So we um, worked with 10 artists across each local authority. Um, and we know that artists are interested in working with collections. When we put out the open call, we only had obviously 10 places, but we had over 90 applications. So we know that this is an area that people want to explore. And this was, was a kind of pilot really in, in setting that journey out. Go to the next slide, please. So just to give you a little insight into how this kind of what we did as part of the Archivist project, I'm just going to concentrate on Bolton as an example um, with an artist that we worked with up there called Claire Barber, um, who worked with Bolton Library and Museum Services, who did a project called um, Spinning Wheels, Muffins and Hedges in Repeat. And this is one of her beautiful handkerchiefs that she produced as part of the project. But just for one moment, can you just have the next slide, please, around um, the story and how that story um, produced these beautiful pieces of new contemporary work. So Claire worked with Caroline Fury from Bolton Archives, and they uncovered an account of a 15-year-old boy called Isaac Entwistle. Now, Isaac lived in Afferton, which is a Afferside, sorry, which is small, um, village just outside Bolton, but he walked um, to from there to the Peterloo massacre on the day. Um, so what Claire did was she relived this journey and brought um, that journey back to life, really. And as she walked that journey, she took photographs. She looked at physical objects such as sheep's wool, um, and she also thought about what. Isaac might have been thought, thinking on that diet day as well. So she did produce these beautiful handkerchiefs and handkerchiefs do play a key role in the Peterloo massacre. Um, there was one afterwards that um, was, was made that people could buy, but on the day people waved handkerchiefs and they also wrapped their bread to share in handkerchiefs on the day. So they had, it was a real kind of connection to, to handkerchiefs, if you like, but also I thought what was beautiful about the story is like reliving Isaac's um, story, 
bringing his story back to life in a contemporary way of just going through that walking and looking at place and how important it is to tell local stories of ordinary people. Um, the handkerchiefs then went on, uh, uh, had an exhibition um, in Bolton. So that again, that story, that remembering uh, Isaac in that way, I think is a lovely way to tell just a very small story about what happened within the Peterloo massacre. Can I have the next slide, please? So out of this, if you look on the, on the new website um, that um, is out, there is a, a, a case study on the archivist. I can't go through all 10 of, of the different um, sort of projects that happened. A lot of them did also engage more with the public. But I think what's interesting is what has come out of it is um, that this, this idea of telling stories through collections and archives is really important and that that creative process in enabling artists to work with people to tell stories is really important around identity and sense of place. And another thing I think that came out of the Ar Artivist project was um, we started working with a team of researchers from the University of Manchester and Lancaster with expertise in like anthropology, sociology and archaeology to create um, a, a new um, sort of toolkit called Collaborate to Create. And the, the toolkit used some of the feedback from the artists, from the archivists, and that now tool toolkit will help others who potentially want to work with archives and collections. I remember when I first started Manchester Histories, I didn't really understand what um, much about archives. It always seemed to be like they were in dusty places in museums that you couldn't access. But I think that is changing and they are a wealth of information around identity place in, in local areas um, across the Greater Manchester. And that was one of the kind of powerful things that came out of this project. Could you just have the next slide, please? So I just wanted to, um, you know, we were delighted to be a part of this project. And this the project has helped us to look at how we um, grow as an organisation, but also how we use archives to work with different groups, different communities and with artists. And I just wanted to finish on this quote. This again is a quote that is in the case study, but this kind of really hit me. Um, so uh, it's from one of the archi archivists who's saying that the perception, perception of archives is changing. And when you think about libraries now, like say Man Manchester Central Library, they are meeting places and people, they can talk, they don't have to whisper anymore. And that they are much more open and public than ever before. And that she says that she thinks archives are following this uh, example. As for example, if you do look at national archives, they are much more open than ever before. And there is a movement, but it's very slow. And it's also about the next generation of archivists coming in now who've got a completely different view on what archives should be, but how more important they should be public facing, um, which I think, again, is a really important thing that came out of this project. But also that <clears throat> archives are everyone's history and everyone's heritage, so people should have access to that. And I think, again, that's that's really important. That's what came out a lot of the learning of this project, that they're a brilliant resource and great creative processes can come out of them. But also they are real stories about people and place. Um, next slide, please. So um, if you want to find out more about Peterloo, there is a website, peterloo1819.co.uk. There's obviously a further um, case study on this particular project, but on that site, you can read more about the other nine boroughs across Greater Manchester that also were involved in this sort of creative process as part of Great Place. And that's my email. So that's all really from me. Um, I hope um, that told the story well, Julie, of, of our experiences of working together um, with, with um, both our collections and artists and the public. Thank you very much. It certainly did, Karen. Um, I've put a link to our website in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure if the Artivist 
case study is up yet, but if it's not up yet, it will be by tomorrow because it's finished. <laughs> it should be up there. Um, uh, Kathleen asked if they can get access, if there's access to the toolkit, if it's possible for other people to get access to the toolkit. Karen, is that possible? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're put, we're, we've got a new website coming up shortly, and on that, um, it will be a downloadable um, resource that people can use. So it's in two parts. One looking at the public and archives and one at looking co at co-creation and working with artists so that'll be in the next couple of months that that comes out brilliant and paul has mentioned anything that facilitates in comments that anything that facilitates increased communication and interest in local areas especially after challenging the past challenging 18 months is to be welcomed that's very true thank you OK, so we're going to um, we're going to move on straight away to um, our next presentation and then there'll be some time for questions after that. Um, we're actually going to now hear from um, Marie Holland and uh, Joshua Sofa and I'm just going to um, I just need to do a bit of tech stuff while I'm, I'm going to have to multitask badly. Um, so they're going to share a presentation. I'm going to just give them a quick introduction while we're setting that up. Uh, so, um, Marie Holland is the Acting Chair for Greater Manchester Arts um, and the Arts and Engagement Manager for Tameside and she's been doing that role since 2014 and previously she was an art curator for Tameside Museum and Gallery and um, she's worked consistently with Tameside's wider communities ensuring everyone has opportunities to participate and create art in Tameside and she's also previously the Chair of Greater Manchester Museums Group. Uh, Joshua Sofe is an, is, um, was our uh, our artist on our we commissioned well um, GM Arts commissioned uh, Josh for um, Cap and Dove so this was his vision um, Joshua works across boundaries borders and disciplines to develop artwork that engages with all levels of society uh, taking place in institutions or on the street occupying art galleries people's homes staged as operas or cast as golden um, sculptures his work weaves with and through social fabric to consider the ideas that hold us all together he's worked in internationally presented work at the science museum in london london um san francisco moma and folk opera and in stockholm amongst many other uh venues and institutions so um Joshua and Marie are going to tell us about Cap and Dove, which was um, a major commission, probably the largest commission that has has occurred, which has involved all 10 districts of Greater Manchester working together. Um, just before this presentation, we were arguing about whether that was the case, but we think that's that's an accurate representation of this project. And GM Arts were a major partner in um, Great Place GM, and it was really important for us that we um, that we worked across all 10 districts, but that as the combined authority, we added value. So we facilitated things to happen that wouldn't have been able to happen necessarily independently or without us. So we saw ourselves as a catalyst for work. So I'll hand over to Marie and Joshua to talk about the very challenging uh, Cap and Dove, a very beautiful project that was um, probably, I've never seen a project quite as affected by COVID-19 as this one. So um, I'll hand over to you and um, Claire, you're showing the slides. So I think you're going to share your screen and I need to sp spotlight you. Is that, can everybody, everyone can see that, that presentation, yeah? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, like I said, I'm Marie Holland. I'm the Arts and Engagement Manager for Tameside, but I'm also the Acting Chair for um, GM Arts. Uh, I am also actually the um, Manager for Tameside Local Studies and Archives. So I was really pleased to hear your presentation before, Karen, and absolutely concur with everything you said. Anyway, we're talking cap and dove. Um, Claire, can I have the second slide, please? Thank you. Um, just like Karen did, I thought I'd just could do a quick introduction to who actually Greater Manchester Arts are, or GM Arts as we're called for short. Uh, we've, we're a network of arts officers, um, art managers, and have been in existence since 2003. And we have a track record for applying for grant funding and for delivering grant funded activity into the hearts of our communities and as a consortium. So between us, we serve 2.8 million Greater Manchester residents. So we've got a large remit. Um, at a district level, we 
all sit within different departments and service areas. We have different responsibilities. Um, we might work with library services more closely. We might work with museum services or local studies or be more event based. We also have different local um, priorities around regeneration, health and well-being and skills development because most of us sit within local authorities. Some of us sit within trusts. But a purpose for us to come together as a network is always to deliver inspirational and artistically excellent uh, experiences for residents and to build provisions in the area of low engagement in the arts. So involving people as participants, as artists, as producers and as audiences. That's always been core to what we do. We also support through our funding that we receive from um, GMCA, we also support local arts infrastructures. So any money that comes via us goes straight out to artists, arts organisations who deliver locally. They might have more of a regional remit, but they deliver locally and they make sure that our local cultural offer are connected back to a more regional offer, both now and in the future. So we are really very much about bridging that local connection with that regional connection. And whilst Greater Manchester is a place rich in cultural assets, it's also really varying in terms of infrastructure and provision and quality um, and profile of culture. So it isn't a unified um, monolithic super city region that is Greater Manchester. We very much are lots of different areas and you can see that on the map we represent all the 10 districts some are rural some are urban some are city some are town centers um so it's just to say that when we work together across the 10 districts it is not always the the simplest way to work but because we come with so many different local priorities but what we all come together with is this desire and need to engage people in arts and culture locally. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So Great Place came along as an opportunity in 2017. So this is pre-pandemic and I think quite hard to remember what that was like almost. And under the theme of um, art in the hearts of cities, uh, GM Arts proposed the, the, the following project. Um, and our aim for this strand really was to maximize existing assets, so existing buildings, collections, museums, heritage, but also to celebrate that collective sense of place. What was it that that brings us all together? What makes us all um, Greater Manchester, Greater Mancunians? What makes us all that? So we broke that down into some further aims. So key for us was to showcase the different places you can stage culture in GM. So it wasn't necessarily building based, it was right into the hearts of communities every street is a stage as the same Wigan and that was really important for us that this whatever this artwork would be it could try it could be part of communities and it could travel into communities it was about making the existing cultural offer more visible so really activating local arts groups organizations bands to show what was within their skills their abilities to involve residents to explore more joint commissioning opportunities with a focus here again on excellence and ambition because Great Place came with the opportunity to actually invest big in some of these areas. To encourage cross-borough work, whilst we all work within our particular districts, we're also aware that our residents move across. We all move across districts, we all work collaboratively. So this was another opportunity to kind of share some of that work and borrow from each other. And that brings with it, a can bring with it um, efficiencies and cost effective solutions also. So that was more around skill sharing. And then it was really important for us to get again to explore a different and digital way of capturing data about engagement in the activity. But most crucially of all, this was about promoting local distinctiveness and collective identity. So it was that balance between the collective impact, but also very much so the local relevance. Next slide, please. Thank you. Can I have the next slide, Claire, please? Yeah, brilliant, perfect. Um, at, oh, sorry, just one back, yeah. I think it's too far ahead, Claire. There, it's slide four, please, that one. Thank you. 
At the time of the project in initiation for this, Peterloo was very much on everybody's minds um, and it was something that we were all working on. So there was a collective theme there already. Um, it draws really closely on the DNA of Greater Manchester um, and that is around Peterloo. It is around that, that pride and that significance of that event brought with it around power, around democracy and around revolt and around standing up for your rights. And Greater Manchester is the home of the cooperative movement, suffragettes. And I'll come back to that kind of DNA, that really inbuilt sense of, of our heritage and what makes us all Greater Mancunians, whether we've brought, been brought up here or whether we've moved here. It was a really big project for the network, both in terms of the scale and the artistic ambition to what we have attempt, had attempted before. But it was something that we knew we wanted to work on. So crucially for us, we appointed um, creative producers rule of three very early on to facilitate our thinking around how this could be and what it could be. And their support has been vital throughout this um, and their methodology very much of embedding artistic projects projects and um, and communities together has been really, really significant. And it was through their help that we were able to appoint Josh, who will talk about the project just, just very, very shortly. Um, the thing I want to say about Josh's proposal and why it was so attractive and why we ultimately went with Josh's work was that he really struck that balance between local distinctiveness and collective impact. There were also a significant number of commissions for local artists and performers, which was brilliant to us. Again, it is about supporting our local arts communities just as it's about supporting our local audiences. And we could say that in nearly every single district, there was a commission for a local artist. Josh has been an absolutely amazing partner on a really long and really COVID challenged project. He has never flagged, he stayed with it throughout. I think it's a credit to him that actually all the performers and producers on this project has stayed with it throughout. Um, but Josh, I think it's over to you now to talk a little bit more about the project and how it developed. Thank you very much, Marie. And uh, yeah, thank you to GM Arts for commissioning the project. Claire, could we have the next slide, please? So this is um, Cap and Dove. It's uh, here in the studio. It's Tim Denton's studio. Tim Denton is a Trafford-based um, maker of furniture predominantly. Uh, he was the person that we went with to build what was a mini traveling art center. So it's got a, a one window museum, it's got a little shop and it's got a theater all in this little unit. And um, the idea is that it would travel um, across Greater Manchester for a series of days of being an art centre, like mini festivals in the 10 different districts. And the structure itself um, is based on the uh, idea of bringing a cart on, to, on wheels that was the platform on which the orators spoke at Peterloo. It's a Peterloo legacy project, but it's very much, so it's connected to Peterloo, but really thinking about contemporary issues in relation to freedom of expression. Could I have the next slide, please? So each of the elements of the structure pertain to um, something connected to the region. Next slide, please. So the rainbow that you see here is the architrave that brings the water down from the gutter, but it also is representing um, the fact that um, LGBTQ rights have been really um, at the forefront of uh, freedom of expression led by Manchester, but every uh, uh, one of the regions in Greater Manchester has uh, a pride march. Next slide, please. Um, the this is the other side of it. So here on the right of this image, you see the one window museum, which was to showcase um, well, it showcased everything from a real Andy Warhol to um, historical paintings around issues of protest to recreations, depending. So a different item went into the museum in each of the areas. This is the little theater that you see there. Next slide, please. Uh, underneath there, I don't know if you can see it uh, really uh, clearly, but it says for the promotion of human happiness. This was um, the subtitle of the project that comes from Stockport Union's 
um, Stockport Union was Stockport Union for the promotion of human happiness. It was a union that was a predominant in Stockport at the time of Peterloo. It was closed down after the Peterloo massacre. It was seen as a as a potentially revolutionary type of organization. But here we're bringing back, reclaiming that as a text work on the on the structure. Next slide, please. And as Marie said, uh, in each of these elements, we try to engage um, different artists working on the different elements of the structure. So here you see a group of students from Bolton University. They were given the task of designing the curtain for Cap and Dove. Next slide, please. And the curtain was designed by uh, Zena Arif, who is a student at Bolton University, and she's using the Peel pattern book, which is a historical 19th century pattern book. She took the design from the Peel pattern book that's in the Bolton archives and remade it in this kaleidoscope design. Next slide, please. Then the door knocker is Sam Bamford's nose. So this was cast from a memorial to Sam Bamford. Sam Bamford was an orator at Peterloo from Middleton, now part of Rochdale Borough. Um, and his nose, you can rub noses with Sam Bamford, was cast in brass. Um, next slide, please. The, uh, oh, yeah, we can go right on from that one. That's a close up of the nose. These are Caroline Dowsett's posters. She's... Um, based in Salford. She's a designer. Um, you might have seen her work. It's, she's everywhere now in Greater Manchester. I think her work's great. Um, and she designed posters for Cap and Dove, a different poster for each of the locations. Next slide, please. We had a series of workshops um, to uh, with, with people that could sign up to learn how to work with wood uh, with Joe Hartley from Standard Practice based in Manchester. And this was the floor of Cap and Dove, which uh, includes recycled Christmas trees um, and um, dyeing the, the, these wooden tiles with uh, natural dyes. Next slide, please. And this is the wallpaper that was designed by Maisie Summer. Um, and each of the elements of the wallpaper refer to a different historical relationship with, um, with the Great Manchester Borough. So for example, there you can see the kidney that was um, referencing the first NHS hospital, which was Trafford General Hospital. The first ever NHS pa patient had nephritis, um, which is a kidney disease. And all the elements here referencing different points uh, of, um, of Greater Manchester boroughs. And then this structure toured and we had a camp, uh, 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 cap and dove company of performers that performed in each of the locations as well as local community slots and inform slots that I'm going to hand over to Marie to talk a little bit more about. Thank you. Claire, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So in practice, um, cap and dove and how it works. Cap and Dove had a core content program by Josh. So that consisted of six spoken word performances by GM based artists and theater makers. Those performances and performers were really diverse and ranged from really fun uh, performances like the history of ice cream in Greater Manchester to really thoughtful and um, quite um, intimate performances around Meet Me at the Cemetery Gate. The content that was programmed alongside that to give it that local relevance uh, was content from museums. So on the slide, you can see um, items from Tameside Museums and Gallery Service around the Chartist movement. And it had an informed slot, which provided local charities and non-profit organizations to engage with Cap and Dove audiences and to promote their initiatives. And then finally, it also had a community element which allowed for local groups and emerging artists to showcase their talents as well. Each of us local leads um, identified local delivery partners for the above slots and that local flavour was entirely within our hands but still and could link to local priorities however Josh was still there to support our local partners to ensure that that activity fitted with the overall vision and theme of the work so it's that constant thing of this sort of the local place, but also that regional relevance so that it hung together thematically as well. Cap and Dove also travelled with a central production team because whilst Cap and Dove was in wheels, it did actually arrive on the back of a lorry and needed to be lifted into place. And But that local production team also worked really closely with local leads on event planning and event management. 
and had gave us support around the central marketing and they also ran a social marketing campaign to activate um, Cap and Duff where it was going into to our local areas and towns and town centres. So I just want to show you a couple of examples in a bit from Cap and Duff. But one thing I just want to reference is the guy you can see in that image. He is an Ashton resident who, and I talked about DNA before, who can trace his heritage back to one of the Peterloo weavers who was there. And the pride he had when he came across this artwork and he came across Cap and Dove in Ashton was amazing. It was an immediate reaction, an immediate response. And one of the things that we found throughout this project actually was that wherever we went, people know what Peterloo is. You might not know it anywhere else, but in Greater Manchester, everybody knows what Peterloo is. It is part of that of that DNA of being a Greater Manchester resident. And that again helps that sense of place. Whilst we're part of something bigger, we're part of Greater Manchester, we're also very much part of our local community. The, the, the um, chap in this picture, his history goes back to weavers in Ashton, but it also links very closely to a combined experience of Peterloo and what that means to people in terms of standing up for their rights. Um, and for democracy. Just to give a few more examples um, of how it varied, but was the same at the same time. Here we are in Rochdale. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, and again, Rochdale partnered with a new retail development to support that site activation post pandemic. So where we've been encouraging people back into our sound town centres, Cap and Dove ended up playing a role in this as well. So this was never an outcome originally, but this is in the post post COVID world, this is one of the outcomes that, that supported that building back of content into our town centers and areas. Um, next slide, Claire, please. No, oh, sorry, you can stay with that one. That's Berry, isn't it? Berry partnered with Berry Art Gallery and Berry Market and linked to their Town of Culture program as well and the Happiness Festival there. Um, Bolton was at Smithfields Hall and they used Cap and Dove to commemorate the Winter Hill Mass Trespass in 1896, which is the biggest um, rights of way protest in the country. It's bigger than Kinder Scout. Um, so it's, again, a really, really important part of Bolton's past. And it was brilliant that Cap and Dove could help mark that too. Finally, here we are in Withenshaw, where we partnered with Manchester Histories and ran an open call for community participants who delivered their content in the heart of Withenshaw. In every place, the articulation was different, but every place also had consistency. The Little Red Arts Centre turned up. It was there. It delivered. Um, in term, terms of local contacts, we had everything from dance groups to Lancashire dialogue broadsheets to women's groups to spoken words to giant polyurethane biscuits to historic ice cream cones to Peterloo bugles and to Andy Warhol prints. We brought items out from museum services that would not otherwise have been able to travel. Next slide, please. I just want to touch briefly on the challenges because this project really was impacting. Sorry, we're re I'm really sorry, we're really right. running over into That's other people's okay. time now. Can you just maybe wrap up in a minute or two? Yes, if you go to the last slide, Cab and Dove in number, there were 10 lead partners, there were 30 plus community partners, or delivery partners, there were 23 community partners, there were 13 commissions for local artists and makers, there were 10 volunteers, we had an audience of over nearly 6,000 and we had 366 participants actively participating in stuff happening in and outside of Cap and Dove. That's it. Thank you very much. This is a massive project and I'm so sorry you had to talk so quickly right. about it. Um, it was a massive challenge. It got, I can't remember how many times it got rescheduled, but we managed to actually, you managed to actually get to eight of the localities out of the 10 and two will happen at some point in the near future and we are hoping that this project will continue so i think when everyone's had a bit of a rest and talk about how what the legacy of this project is and how we can use the wonderful artifacts and the, the artwork and the, and the amazing arts into how it can be used in the in the future um, i'm going to move straight on uh, and then i'll come back to any questions that anyone has for josh marie or um, karen at the end. So I'm going to move straight on now to to Tom and Gabby. So Tom Crompton and Gabby Porter. So 
Tom is the founder and director of Common Cause Foundation, and he works on human values, what matters to people, and what shapes what matters to people. And he's going to be talking along with Gabby Porter uh, about a project that we commissioned. So Gabby is... Um, Oh, Gabby, I've lost I've blown that. <laughs> the associate an associate of the Happy Museum, which works for the well-being of people, place and planet. Um, and Happy Museum and Common Cause Foundation have worked together over several years, including um, a major project with Manchester Museum, which, of course, I knew. But because I couldn't find to read it, it went out of my head. <laughs> so you're, <laughs> you're going to talk about a project that was a really interesting one that was um, a very, uh, again, very impacted by COVID, having to go online, um, working with organisations that were closed to the public, whilst exploring the um, how the things that matter to the public impact on uh, culture venues. So um, I'll hand over to you both now. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. So I was. Can you hear me? Okay. Can I have a thumbs up? If. Yeah. Um, I, I was just going to give. Uh, briefly a little of a conceptual background for the project and then hand over to Gabby who is going to um, uh, say something about what it actually entailed practically. Um, so um, we, uh, it, through this collaboration between Common Cause Foundation and the Happy Museum, uh, we launched an inquiry around the values of the people of Greater Manchester and uh, citizens' perception of their fellow citizens' uh, values. And I just wanted to say something what, about what we mean uh, by values, because it's, uh, it's we, we use it in the sense which is perhaps a bit different to how it's often used in the vernacular to mean honesty or trustworthiness or kind of uh, moral principles. Uh, we use it in the way that social psychologists use the word to uh, mean a range of standards or principles uh, that you might carry through life and that help to inform your attitudes and behaviours. So they would certainly include values like honesty and trustworthiness, but would also include um, other principles or standards like, for example, uh, perhaps our appetite for self-indulgence or for uh, public recognition um, or fame. Those would also be seen as, as values in the sense in which we're uh, talking about it. So the background to this work was uh, a survey that uh, we conducted in collaboration uh, with academic social psychologists and funded uh, in part by Big Lottery England. Uh, we surveyed 1,200 people across all 10 districts in Greater Manchester, asking them firstly about their values using a standard values survey that social psychologists use. And we found that typically um, people reported attaching uh, particular importance on what we call compassionate values. So values of community, of social justice, of uh, environmental uh, protection, of um, friendship. Uh, that doesn't seem to be as a result of a reporting bias. People seem we could control for that. People seem genuinely committed um, overwhelmingly to those values. Then we moved on to ask people, well, imagine a typical fellow uh, citizen of Greater Manchester. What do you think they hold to be most important? And we found that people, uh, respondents, typically underestimated the importance that a person placed on those values, those compassionate values, and tended to overestimate the importance that a typical fellow citizen placed on values like uh, wealth or social status. And that misperception about others' values seemed to matter because it predicted lower well-being to the extent that a person suffered uh, this misperception, this tendency to assume that others um, placed more importance on wealth and social status, public image than was actually the case. That tended to, that predicted lower well-being, lower civic participation, people were less likely to volunteer or vote if they suffered that misperception, lower connection to community and lower support for a range of social or environmental uh, policies and interventions. And what we uh, found was, was that actually many of the social institutions that people encounter on a day-to-day -day basis in their lives uh, across Manchester may serve inadvertently to reinforce this misperception, this tendency to perceive that others place less importance on social justice, um, environmental protection or community than is actually the case. 
And we saw within that a crucial opportunity for arts and cultural organizations to begin to help to uh, correct, if you like, that misperception, to simply reflect experientially to their audiences the simple insight that they typically care more for one another and the wider world than they might currently recognize. So what did that mean in practice? Uh, well, with uh, uh, it, articulating that through the Great Place uh, project, uh, we worked with a group of arts and cultural organizations across Manchester. Gabby, you're going to say more, I hope, about what that actually entailed. Yeah, so like the other projects, we started off before COVID and we had we started to work with a small group of uh, museums and heritage organisations on a kind of, um, I suppose, an action research uh, to encourage them to think about the values framework and how they might address that perception gap and then to frame some practical projects where they would experiment with different approaches to bring that lens of compassionate values more strongly through their work. That was interrupted by the pandemic and um, I suppose the pandemic in a way gave us an opportunity to rethink how we might work and we then reconfigured the program so we worked with a much larger number and wider range of organizations across the cultural sector and across different districts within GM and asking a couple of people from I think 13 organizations to come together with us to explore values and we did that um, through a series of three workshops with some drop-in sessions and a couple of follow-on sessions and particularly starting with inviting to pe people to think about what really really mattered to them and using the frame of values that Tom has described what really is you know in their hearts what really really matters to them and then to think about how, to what extent that was supported by the organisations and that they were the ways in which they worked with each other within their organisations and the overall values that were enacted and lived in those organisations. To what extent did they feel supported and recognised and to what extent did they feel frustrated? And then in the um, further on in the workshops, we encouraged participants to then think about how they might expand those conversations to their wider communities and how that might impact their relationships with their communities. And I guess, you know, because this was a time when everything that cultural organisations um, had kind of live, you know, their livelihoods in every possible way were being challenged by the pandemic. Um, we really invited people to think about what really matters and what might the future look like if we bring these compassionate values to the fore of our work and think about our relationships with our colleagues and our communities. Um, so Tom, do you want to pick up the bat on there and say a little bit? I think you're on mute. I don't think I've got anything to add to that, Gabby. OK, so I guess um, you know, some of the things that came up really clearly were that to have these conversations around things that are really personal and precious was for many it was a new experience and just that um creating the space in which to really listen to each other and listen to um those you know, very personal values was incredibly revealing um, for many of our participants. 
and people felt also that there was a huge value in overcoming silos that might exist within their organisations, but also to connect with cultural organisations across the whole range and across the different regions, different districts in ways that perhaps they hadn't been able to before. And um, it was really, people really valued the opportunity, uh, in their words, to step off the treadmill and to be able to move away from the relentless kind of cycle of ongoing activity and to really think about what matters and really think about the future. Um, I think we were impeded by, um, you know, only meeting and connecting online and also we were impeded by the kind of on and off situation that we were in with lockdown. So a constant kind of uncertainty about what the timescales might be and also the very profound um, the very profound situation of people being so uncertain about their future and the possibility of redundancies and what the furlough scheme would be and so on. So all those things kind of limited um, some of the uh, attention and participation. But um, I, would, I don't know whether this is possible. Karen, would you like to say a few words about your involvement in the project? Yeah, I mean, um, we'd already worked with Common Cause on the Peterloo project before in terms of looking at values and this approach around kind of compassionate values. And then when we did um, the, the workshops with you, um, Gabby and Tom, and with the other cultural organisations, like, I think like what you're saying, it did really offer us an opportunity to really reflect at a point that was in, we were all in crisis, if you know, and having that time um, to speak to others who were in a similar situation as ourselves and looking at and exploring really what matters to us as people, but as organisations. But I think also what it did offer was this kind of bigger picture of values across Greater Manchester and how collectively we were working to start to think about these things together. And I think that was quite powerful and strong at a time when um, we were uncertain um, and we still are uncertain in some ways, but that reflection at, um, and being involved in looking at compassionate values and better understanding ourselves as people, but also our organizations in the sector and how we can reflect and to move forward because it, it was a, a, a turbulent time. And I remember those sessions being really important to myself, just as you say, step off that treadmill and have conversations with others who are in similar situations. And that really did help to influence our business plan that we've got now and to connect with others across Greater Manchester. So I thank you for that really, because it was a, a great place for supporting that because it was really a, a part of the medicine, if you like, of helping us to think about how we we're going to get through COVID. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. And just to mention a couple of other um, examples, and there are more in the case study as well, um, but the Craft and Design Centre were going through a process of revisioning and thinking differently about their future already and they found this a really really strong and important resource and kind of provocation for them to think about what they might be and who they might be and why they would exist going forward and to rethink of them their role as a community resource and a place for others rather than just a destination um, and the values of care also within their working practices and the Turnpike Gallery in Wigan ha had to suspend their temporary exhibition programme and um, they began to reach out to other partners and initiatives locally. So they started to work with the Wildlife Trust and with the Town Centre um, redesign and thinking afresh about the Town Centre, but they also began to think very differently about the artists they might work with and who those artists might be and to offer uh, to invite more participatory 
artists, but also to extend the term and the contracts um, for those artists working with them and with communities. So a much longer and deeper relationship in the way that you were talking about at the beginning, Liz, of those long, slow building of relationships and trust. So, Tom, anything more to add? I'm aware we're running over time. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it was, that was a great summary. I thought, Gabby, I don't have anything to add, no. So I think the, I, the thing was that we were inviting this, uh, using this as a time for reflection at the time of COVID. How can compassionate values play in the life of your organisation and in your relationships with your colleagues and communities going forward? So it wasn't a template, it was an invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that this work was, is really significant at this moment because we're thinking about the role, the civic role of arts and cultural organisations and the civic role of culture and creativity. Um, and and the place for those organisations and their presence on high streets and in town centres and not just in in institutional buildings but their presence in alternative spaces and I think that this work has really helped has really contributed to thinking that we're doing great Manchester around that. I'm going to move on to our last so thank you very much I'm going to move on to our last speaker um, and that's Chris Wright and he is um, executive producer at Future Everything. And he's going to be talking about a project called This Place of Mine, which is a digital engagement project um, with the Young Producer Pro Program. Um, Chris joined Future Everything in 2020, um, but before that worked for 25 years as a creative producer and director across a range of organisations. Um, he was a producer at the Royal Exchange for nine years and recently worked at MIF. So he's going to talk to us about this place of mine and the um, an approach that we took to sort of creative engagement with young people around the revisioning of their town centres and high streets. So over to you, Chris. Thank you. I'll just Great. do all the jiggly pokery with the spotlighting. OK, well, you're doing the jiggly pokery. I'll start then. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, so afternoon, everybody. And it's a real privilege to be here uh, in such esteemed company and such inspiring projects. Uh, I really hope you're not hitting that kind of online fatigue moment yet. I'll try to sort of keep things kind of upbeat and uh, to, to get through towards the end. Uh, just to say everything that I will talk about is in the case study that we put on the Great Place uh, GM. Uh, .org website, so uh, you'd have to take notes, you can go back and refer to it then. Uh, I don't have a slideshow, it'll just be me talking, but I'll share with you a, a link to the um, the project output, which you can take a look at later on as, 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 I, as I continue talking. Uh, so just to say, so this place of mine, which is the name of our project, this, this began as a project remarkably over two years ago now, and with everything that has happened with the pandemic, it, I think it's incredible that the project has had this kind of longevity, which I think is testament to the fact how relevant it was then and also how relevant it is now, but also to all the partners' commitments uh, and, and belief in the project. Uh, before I start to talk about it, I, do, I just do want to give a big shout out to Claire Tymon, who, as you know, is, is, is in the rooms and working closely with Julie uh, on this. And Claire was my colleague at Future Everything when we started this project uh, up until earlier this year when, when she left. And Claire categorically was responsible for the initiation and development of this project from, from Future Everything's side. And she was that main catalyst in terms of working with the partners and the success of this project is very much credit to her, uh, it, 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 you know, as, as much as anyone else. So, yeah, uh, I miss Claire every day, uh, add future everything, but I just wanted to kind of put out the, the, the significant role that, that, that she played in this project. OK, so what was the challenge? Um, so as I think, as we're all aware, uh, the role and function of town centres uh, has been shifting for the, for, you know, for, for quite a long time, particularly in the high streets across Greater Manchester, where there's now a focus of renewed investment uh, towards the rediscovery of placemaking and socialising and learning using the high street as very much a sort of focus, the sort of arena for that. And also, as we're all aware, very sense the sense that art and creativity should play a crucial role in this. Um, 
in order to develop more innovative and alternative place-based um, strategies where we can use different schemes. And these things have started to pop up in kind of future high street fund and heritage uh, um, actions on projects. So the question that we were looking at was how can we specifically with young people enhance their role in placemaking uh, in, in, uh, across Greater Manchester and how can we tap into art and creativity, particularly um, digital art, which would place the future of their towns at the centre of what they're thinking about and also start to influence decisions that are being made about the high street. So we devised, working with a number of partners across Greater Manchester, we devised a, a plan that would involve working directly with young people and also using art and creativity. And that original plan included uh, in-person workshops with young people across districts in Greater Manchester, but also having a physical three-dimensional digital touring artwork, which would be rolled out in the sort of spring, early summer of last year. And then, of course, COVID hit and that changed everything for us. But what I would say, what I would propose is that actually, in this instance, COVID changed things for the better because of the way that it made us re rethink. So when we, when we went to rescope the, the original project, we started to, to think about linking it with other local and regional priorities, and particularly looking at the GM digital strategy, where they're looking, they're, they're trying to set out to facilitate a region um, which kind of has a difference, can drive a real change together. And we also looked at different reports as well to do with young people and, and digital engagement. And the Childwise reports in 2014 confirmed a few things, which just really suggests that this generation of young people are described what we call digital natives. So, for example, um, they're much more aware of social issues and seeing themselves as global uh, citizens. And they, they define their relationship very much about digital technology and how connectivity can permeate their life and transform different ways of how they interact and socialize. So the question that we came to in a in response to the pandemic with the challenge was, how can we create an accessible online space for young people across Greater Manchester to explore the future of their high streets whilst using digital tools, creative storytelling and collaborative um, methodologies which would be with the aim of trying to inspire change in their place okay so looking at what our approach was so as i said we worked with with the gmca and we were the great manchester arts network and that's future everything we developed this project that was called this place of mine and this place of mine uh, is a digital action research project which gives young people in greater manchester an opportunity to explore the future of their high streets and the, uh, the project aimed to make a difference in a number of ways, including we wanted to amplify young people's voices and give them a digital platform for their visions of the future high street. And we also wanted to explore the role of digital arts as an approach to transforming high streets into places for cultural programming. So we did, we did an initial R&D phase that included a very detailed scoping of what the, of the GM localities, potential stakeholders, and what the young people provision was at the time and the different uh, the different disciplines they used and the different capacities that they had. Uh, and, and after that scoping, uh, it was confirmed that it would be five district partners, which were Beswick, Lee, Oldham, Rochdale and Staley Bridge, and, and they became the key partners for the project. Um, after a lot of rescoping and a lot of kind of rescheduling because of the demands that COVID placed and the uncertainty, in September of 2020, we, we took the project exclusively online and we launched what we called the Young Producer Scheme. And this was launched for 10 young people across the five districts in Greater Manchester, so it was two per, per district. Um, and we did a series of immersive, interactive online workshops where the young producers, they explored place and heritage and the, and the future of the high streets to create a new digital artworks um, and to also create an online experience that we were going to call the This Place of Mind Hub. Critically, we also had five citizen futurist artists, and these were local Greater Manchester emerging artists who were at a certain point in their career, and we commissioned them to also create digital artwork for, for the hub, but also, and this is really key, to mentor and work closely with, with the young producers, so they were working with, with the professional artists along the way. Uh, and to ensure that we tackled any obstacles to digital in inclusion, we partnered with Manchester Tech Fund, who, who, who very generously supplied laptops and tablets for all the participants who were no obstacles to, to inclusion there. And then in February, after, after months of co-design, collaborative, inspiring workshops, working with these incredible young people online in what was a very challenging time for them, 
we launched the This Place of Mind hub. Um, and this is an interactive online world and virtual gallery. And the Young Producers also worked with a uh, Manchester-based um, creative technologist called Studio Treble, and they work closely to create this virtual playground. So what I, what I will propose now is in order to give you some sort of visual uh, stimulus, if you want to, it's entirely up to you, but if, if you want to go into your um, uh, server and put thisplaceofmind.org, you can start to have a look at the online hub if you'd like to do that whilst I'm talking. Just to say it does have a soundtrack to it, so a top right icon, you can you can silence that um, um, uh, as I'm talking through it. So through the project, this, this, you know, we're really, there's some really interesting stats which kind of feed back on it. So, so we work with five local authorities uh, across, across Greater Manchester. We work with 10 young producers aged 13 to 21. We work with 12 artists, designers and creative technologists. We did seven online workshops. On the hub, there are 20 newly commissioned pieces of digital artwork from the young producers and for, and for, for professional artists. Uh, and so far, we've had over 7,000 visitors to the hub. Um, really importantly as well, particularly for the young producers in terms of that industry acknowledgement, uh, the hub won four prestigious CSS awards, uh, which is a kind of industry uh, digital um, technology award. So we won it for website of the day and best innovation and best user end experience uh, design so we were really thrilled but particularly thrilled for, for for the young producers that we had that they had that kind of feedback that the industry was saying this work you're doing is incredible the impact you're making is really important so talking about the impact we we we, we believe that this place of mind was a welcome gateway for the young people to join the conversation um about place um, and with the young producers really embrace the opportunity to collaborate with professional artists and uh, to um, develop their digital skills, but also to connect with their peers as well across Greater Manchester. And they, and they became much more aware of the localities and, and they fostered this identity as a Greater Manchester citizen. Um, and the young producers, ex, you know, they expressed pride in how creative and proactive that they've been. Um, and their digital skills were used to share their visions for the futures of the town. And if you go on the you can see lots of different ideas. They've got different artworks which suggest through text, through poetry, through immersive gaming, what their ideas for the future of, of, of the arts and uh, of, the, of the high street uh, may be. The partner organisations that we work with described that the, they, the way they felt the impact the most was the different approach to working with young people, and it, and it strengthened their desire to engage with young ambassadors in placemaking. Um, and I think that this is a really imp important thing that, that, that what that this place of mine has done because it's presented innovative and alternative approaches to public consultation. So there are alternative methods for local authorities and councils and uh, of working cross departments um, towards town planning, but using it in a really kind of inspirational way and um, one of the things that was on the hub as well is we asked visitors to answer questions um, about their visions of the future of the high street and, and there's an interesting couple of stats here is that some of the 58 percent of the visitors said they'd wanted to completely rebuild their high street um, and 56 percent said they they would want to make art very much the center of that high street as well so just to finish up so i'm very conscious of time as well and um, so in terms of what we learn the pandemic, as we all know, posed lots of challenges for us, but it also gave us an opportunity to develop a new and innovative methods of delivery and, and of consultation. And we learned that you can work, not just with young people, but across all communities, In you can work across that digital realm, even for those people who've got limited digital experience. And a digital platform can give can, can give the opportunity for young people to express themselves in unexpected and, and, and insightful ways that go beyond that usual sense of consultation. That, um, and also we, we learned about how to make the digital space as inclusive as possible, um, whilst also nurturing the well-being of those participants and, and how to adapt to their particular kind of learning styles and communication style, things like turning cameras off, typing replies instead of speaking, feedback through kind of collaborative software as well. So 
that's the key learning is, is that we can blend in-person and virtual engagement at the same time to, 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 to come up with something interesting. One of the really exciting legacies is several of the young producers that we work with have, have progressed with their newfound interest in place. So one has joined the Town Youth Council, one has become a place ambassador, and one is even starting a degree in architecture fo focus on, on, on the development of the high street. So just to conclude, I've given quite a lot of information there with that. Um, we think that this place of mine very much felt like a, a project for our time. It felt really, really relevant now. And it was really important the way we worked with multiple partners across uh, Greater Manchester to give that voice to young people so they can have a creative and a social and a political say on the future of their high street. And we think now we've got an output with this hub, which is a which is an alternative of moving forward of, of how we talk about the high street and a consultation and a creative engagement tool to engage with communities across um, Greater Manchester. So please do take a look at the hub, explore, share it. It's really immersive. It's a great deal of fun. And it's just testament to the incredible vision artistry and commitment and belief of the young people across Greater Manchester. With this future generation, I think we are in very safe hands. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you, Chris. And it's um, look, 30 seconds before two o'clock. And um, I realise that there really hasn't been a lot of time for questions. If anyone has questions, um, you're more than welcome to ask them right now. Um, we will make um, any presentations, as many presentations as we can available. I would um, really encourage you to look at the greatplacegm.co.uk website um, for all of the case studies uh, about the projects and an overarching statement as well about what we've achieved which will be uploaded in the next few days um, so it just um, I don't think anyone has got any burning questions it um, there's been a lot of content in this session we've tried to keep them short but obviously we're trying to pack in a lot so I want to thank all of the contributors contributors um, very very much for your time and also for participants for um, for staying online with us for an hour and a half um, yeah most people have to leave for a two o'clock meeting um, so um, yeah it just remains to me to say thank you we've got a huge legacy from this program moving forward um, with the live well um, manifesto commitment and with the work to um, to make greater manchester the first creative health city region and the place-based work that we're doing as well so um, please do keep in touch so thank you very much everyone for attending and I'd just like to say a special thank you for um, for to Claire Time and for all of the support that she's given me during uh, the creation and delivery of these webinars. So thank you very much everybody and hopefully speak to most of you soon.